Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Respiratory physiology is being discussed under these headings we have completed the lecture on cellular respiration and the lectures on transport of oxygen in blood including tissue and arterial hypoxia. In this lecture, we will consider transport of carbon dioxide in blood. The tissues put out about 200 milliliters of carbon dioxide per minute in the resting state in the reference adult male. This would translate to a steady state output of 2 to 3 millimoles per liter. How do we get this figure? 200 milliliters of carbon dioxide that comes out per minute will be added to the cardiac output. That is 5 liters of blood flowing through the tissues every minute. So 200 ml in 5 liters would translate to a steady state output of 2 to 3 millimoles per liter. The carbon dioxide that comes out into venous blood exists in three forms. Some of it is dissolved carbon dioxide. The rest of it enters red blood cells. A minor fraction is in combination with hemoglobin as carbaminohemoglobin. The major fraction, however, gets hydrated in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, forms carbonic acid which would dissociate to bicarbonate and protons. We can imagine that the acidity of carbon dioxide is captured in the proton and the rest of it exists as bicarbonate. If this reaction has to continue and all of the carbon dioxide that enters venous blood should be converted to these forms, then the end products have to be continuously removed. The protons bind to hemoglobin. This is what is referred to as reduced hemoglobin. Carbaminohemoglobin is different. That is carbon dioxide directly in combination with hemoglobin. The protons are buffered by hemoglobin and that is how they are cleared from the intracellular fluid and does not allow the acidity to increase. The bicarbonate is eliminated by an anion exchanger in the red blood cell membrane which would exchange the bicarbonate with chloride ions. This is the famous hamburger chloride shift and therefore the concentration of chloride in venous blood is going to be less than that in arterial blood because some of the chloride has translocated to within the red blood cells. And because of the same phenomenon, the concentration of bicarbonate in venous blood is going to be more than the concentration of bicarbonate in arterial blood. To summarize, there are three forms of carbon dioxide in venous blood. Dissolved carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide existing as bicarbonate, this is the major fraction and carbaminohemoglobin in combination with hemoglobin. Once blood enters pulmonary capillaries, oxygen enters the red blood cell and binds to hemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin is stated to be a stronger acid than reduced hemoglobin. An acid is something which will allow protons to exist in the free form. It will protonate easily. Once oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it is going to knock off the protons and that is why oxyhemoglobin is stated to be a stronger acid than reduced hemoglobin. In reduced hemoglobin, the protons are kept in the bound form, whereas when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it knocks the protons off. This is going to increase the acidity with, within the red blood cell and the drop in pH may be thought of as reversing the direction of the anion exchanger now, which brings in bicarbonate, whatever excess was formed in systemic blood that amount of bicarbonate re-enters the red blood cell exchanging with chloride. And now the products of the reaction of this reaction are building up within the red blood cell in the pulmonary capillary. The reverse reaction goes on. Water is formed and carbon dioxide is formed. The carbon dioxide moves into plasma. The concentration of carbon dioxide in venous plasma is measured in terms of partial pressure, it is stated to be 45 millimeter mercury. 
The partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveolus is at 40 millimeter mercury. How does this come about? We will learn that shortly. We will learn that ventilation is adjusted precisely to keep alveolar carbon dioxide at a certain desired level and we will see why later. Since alveolar carbon dioxide is lower than venous carbon dioxide, there is movement of carbon dioxide from venous blood into the alveolus which is finally eliminated. Now since carbon dioxide concentration in blood cannot go lower than alveolar carbon dioxide, arterial blood has a concentration of carbon dioxide such that the partial pressure is 40 millimeter mercury, the same as alveolus. This would translate to an actual carbon dioxide concentration of 1.2 millimoles per liter in arterial blood. We will now see what is the logic of measuring carbon dioxide concentrations as partial pressures. We have seen in the lectures on oxygen transport that gases exert a pressure measurable as a partial pressure in gaseous mixtures, but they do not exert any kind of a partial pressure when existing in the dissolved form in liquids. Why then do we talk about a partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood and venous blood? Now, it is because of the convention of measuring the carbon dioxide concentrations in blood. The way it is done, the sample of blood taken from the artery or the vein is taken into a test tube with a very small amount of air on top. It is toppered tightly so that there is no leak of air. And after some time, the carbon dioxide, remember, this would have been atmospheric air initially. It has zero carbon dioxide. After some time, carbon dioxide from the blood would have evolved into the space here. And what is actually measured is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in this space, free space. That is measured to be 40 millimeter mercury in arterial blood. And when that is the case, we know that the dissolved carbon dioxide is going to be 1.2 millimoles per liter. It is because of the way we measure it, we normally refer to carbon dioxide concentrations in blood as partial pressures. The conversion factor is for every millimeter mercury PCO2, the amount dissolved would be 0 0.03 millimoles per liter or 0 0.003 millimoles per 100 ml. That's the conversion factor. To recap, 2 to 3 millimoles per liter of carbon dioxide is put out into venous blood by tissues. It travels in three forms, bicarbonate, dissolved carbon dioxide and that bound to hemoglobin as carbaminohemoglobin. This is the major fraction however. And this fraction would reconvert to carbon dioxide upon entering pulmonary capillaries. The concentrations of carbon dioxide in these three sites is important to remember. Venous carbon dioxide is 45 millimeter mercury, dissolved carbon dioxide. Alveolar carbon dioxide is at 40 millimeter mercury. Arterial carbon dioxide is equal to alveolar carbon dioxide and is also at 40 millimeter mercury. Carbon dioxide in blood does not exert partial pressures, but we refer to them as partial pressures because of the way we measure them. The actual concentrations would be this into 0 0.03, that is 1.2 millimoles per liter in arterial blood. And by the same count, 45 into 0 0.03 would be 1.35 millimoles per liter carbon dioxide in venous blood. We will wipe the slate clean and keep only the components that we are interested in. We will represent dissolved carbon dioxide like that. That's 0.15 millimoles per liter, which came from the tissue carbon dioxide. The bicarbonate is at 2 millimoles per liter, let us say. These are interchangeable. In the pulmonary capillary, this bicarbonate would reform carbon dioxide and the whole thing will be eliminated in the lung. The question that I would now like to ask is, if carbon dioxide is a waste product, why doesn't the lung remove all the carbon dioxide in blood? Why does it allow some carbon dioxide to move into arterial blood? Why do we have 
a certain amount of carbon dioxide in arterial blood? The answer to this is the carbon dioxide in arterial blood is essential to maintain pH of blood because there is a lot of bicarbonate in blood. The bicarbonate here is there for a certain reason and if not countered by so much carbon dioxide, this bicarbonate will increase the pH of blood outside the range that will be compatible with life and therefore the lung titrates the amount of carbon dioxide that it releases into arterial blood. This carbon dioxide is there to buffer the bicarbonate that is there in blood. You could think of bicarbonate as the pH offender here and carbon dioxide being there to counter the pH change due to bicarbonate. This bicarbonate from arterial blood moves into venous blood as well and so does this carbon dioxide. Therefore, the total free carbon dioxide or dissolved carbon dioxide in venous blood would be the 0.15 millimoles per liter that came from the tissues and the 1.2 millimoles per liter that came from arterial blood. So, the total is 1.35 millimoles per liter and that is how we get a partial pressure of carbon dioxide in venous blood as 45 millimeters mercury. This represents the carbon dioxide that came from tissues, the bicarbonate and the free carbon dioxide which came from the tissues. So, these two compartments are interchangeable. The carbon dioxide becomes bicarbonate in systemic circulation and in pulmonary circulation it reforms, the bicarbonate reforms the carbon dioxide. The whole thing is therefore eliminated in the lungs. The bicarbonate has become carbon dioxide and it is eliminated in the lungs. So, whatever was formed in the tissues is completely eliminated in the lungs. The bicarbonate in the blue bar that was in arterial blood and which came into venous blood as well is actually formed in the kidneys. The kidneys generate a certain amount of bicarbonate to keep that concentration. The role of this bicarbonate is to buffer fixed acids. Fixed acids is another form of acids formed in the tissues during tissue metabolism. Carbon dioxide can be thought of as the volatile acid because it can be easily eliminated in the lungs and there are fixed acids like lactic acid, sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, etc., which are called fixed acids because they cannot be eliminated in the lungs directly and we need other means of handling them while they exist in blood. The fixed acids would give up their protons and become the corresponding anion lactates for example. These protons should not reduce the pH of venous blood and that is where the bicarbonate in the blue compartment comes into play. The protons released from fixed acids bind to the bicarbonate to form carbon dioxide in the reverse reaction and that carbon dioxide is then eliminated in the lungs. The amount that is consumed per liter of blood is very little, it is only about 10 micromoles per liter, a very small amount in comparison to the actual concentration in plasma. So, the bicarbonate reserve of plasma is very high and only a very tiny amount is taken up by the fixed acids which come in to every liter of plasma. You could think that the fixed acids are converted to the volatile acid by the bicarbonate generated by the kidneys and that is given off a small component in addition to the tissue carbon dioxide. This is a small uh, component which is also eliminated in the lungs. Whatever bicarbonate is consumed by the fixed acids, the kidneys constantly replace that quantum. So, this bicarbonate and carbon dioxide, they keep circulating between arterial blood and venous blood. In fact, that is the only bicarbonate present in arterial blood. Therefore, we can think of arterial bicarbonate 
as renal bicarbonate that is necessary for buffering fixed acids. The excess bicarbonate that you find in venous blood is actually carbon dioxide that came from the tissues. This excess bicarbonate was formed from carbon dioxide within the erythrocytes and it will reform carbon dioxide once the erythrocytes reach the pulmonary circulation. So this incremental bicarbonate as it can be called, it is a temporary form of carbon dioxide and we can call it erythrocyte bicarbonate because this is formed in the erythrocytes. To summarize these phenomena, there is a certain amount of bicarbonate in arterial blood which is necessary for buffering fixed acids. The lungs therefore titrate ventilation so as to permit a certain amount of carbon dioxide to go into arterial blood. The carbon dioxide that is there in arterial blood sets the pH at 7.4 while the bicarb there is at 24 milliequivalents per liter. This bicarbonate and carbon dioxide are there by default in blood. This bicarbonate comes from kidneys and this carbon dioxide can be thought of as that which is allowed to come into blood from the lungs. These are not in any way related to tissue output of carbon dioxide. Tissues generate this much carbon dioxide and that travels in blood as a little bit of free carbon dioxide dissolved in plasma and as bicarbonate. We called this erythrocyte bicarbonate. This is added on to the renal bicarbonate in venous plasma. This represents the amount of carbon dioxide formed in the tissues. They are interchangeable. This is indeed carbon dioxide and the whole thing will be eliminated in the lungs. We will now consider some other things about the volume of carbon dioxide generated in tissues. How do we get this number as 200 ml per minute? Remember, we did a similar calculation for oxygen. Oxygen consumption in the tissues was 250 ml per minute in the reference adult male in the resting state. How did we get at that number? We were able to estimate oxygen concentration in arterial blood as 20 milliliters per 100 ml blood. You know the equation from the previous lectures. Similarly, oxygen concentration in venous blood is 15 milliliters per 100 ml blood. Therefore, the arteriovenous oxygen difference is 5 ml per 100 ml blood. And there was 5 liters of blood coming to the tissues per minute. Multiplying the two, we got 250 ml of oxygen reaching the tissues or being consumed by the tissues per minute. Can we do a similar calculation for the amount of carbon dioxide that is put out by the tissues? If we were to do that, we have to take the arteriovenous carbon dioxide difference and that is indeed 4 milliliters per 100 ml blood. If you multiply 4 milliliters per 100 ml into cardiac output, you would indeed get carbon dioxide generation as 200 milliliters per minute. Now, how do we get AV carbon dioxide difference as 4 ml per 100 ml blood? If you look at lab reports, there is a certain term called total carbon dioxide. They would say the total carbon dioxide in arterial blood is 48 ml in 100 ml blood and in venous blood it is 52 ml per 100 ml blood. The difference is therefore 4 ml per 100 ml blood. I am not quite comfortable with this idea because the way they get this amount as 48 ml carbon dioxide per 100 ml blood is by converting all of this into carbon dioxide. Blood would be titrated with enough strong acid, say hydrochloric acid, to convert all this bicarb into carbon dioxide and that is what is estimated as total carbon dioxide as 48 ml, which to me does not sound right because this bicarbonate is not a transport form of carbon dioxide. It is not tissue carbon dioxide or anything. It is bicarbonate generated in the kidneys existing in blood for a different purpose. 
converting all this into carbon dioxide and calling that as total carbon dioxide sounds a little incorrect to me. Similarly, in venous blood, you have what was calculated in arterial blood plus what was given out from the tissues, which is indeed 4 ml per 100 ml blood. That is how you get the 52 ml. So, though this way of calculating amount of carbon dioxide formed in tissues as arteriovenous carbon dioxide difference into cardiac output, though this is seemingly correct, the idea of thinking about this fraction as total carbon dioxide in arterial blood can lead to some grave misconceptions. However, this is the norm uh, in lab reports and you should understand total carbon dioxide in arterial blood is not carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, but it is an estimate of bicarbonate and carbon dioxide. In fact, the real carbon dioxide being minuscule with respect to the bicarbonate, the total carbon dioxide in arterial blood is indeed the bicarbonate of arterial blood. So, one way of calculating volume of carbon dioxide coming from tissues is to multiply the arteriovenous carbon dioxide difference by cardiac output. There is another way of estimating carbon dioxide released by tissues because all this carbon dioxide is eliminated in the lungs, whatever be the situation. An estimate of the carbon dioxide exhaled will tell us how much of carbon dioxide is formed in the tissues. We will see how to calculate amount of carbon dioxide exhaled. If we can estimate the volume of air exhaled with every breath and the concentration of carbon dioxide in exhaled air, we can multiply the two to get at carbon dioxide exhaled per breath. And if we multiply per breath carbon dioxide with the respiratory rate, we can get the amount of carbon dioxide which is formed in the tissues every minute because respiratory rate is number of breaths per minute. Now, before saying how to get the volume of exhaled air, let us look at lung volumes. Lung volume at the end of expiration, what is called functional residual capacity. You have learnt these volumes and capacities at school. At the end of expiration, in a reference adult male, the lung volume which is called functional residual capacity is 2 litres. It is composed of the alveolar volume plus dead space volume. The gas that occupies the respiratory passages that is trachea bronchi and the bronchioles is referred to as dead space because that air does not participate in gas exchange with blood in the capillaries. Only the alveolar air participates in gas exchange. At the end of a normal expiration, the volume of air in the lungs, which is composed of alveolar volume plus dead space volume is 2 liters and that is what is referred to as functional residual capacity. So, that is shown here. 2 liters of functional residual capacity is composed of alveolar volume and dead space volume. The dead space volume in the reference adult male is about 150 ml. So, the actual alveolar volume would be 2 liters minus 150 ml. This is the end expiratory state. Let us consider composition of air. Let this be a sample of atmospheric air. It is composed of nearly 80 percent nitrogen and the rest oxygen. If you look at alveolar air, there are two other gases in addition. There is water vapor because as air passes through the respiratory passages, water vapor is added. There is also carbon dioxide which comes from blood into the alveolus. This is the scenario in the end expiratory state where the dead space is also filled with air which contains water vapor and carbon dioxide because you would have
blown out alveolar air and the dead space also has a similar to the alveolar air in composition. What happens during inspiration? During inspiration, if the tidal volume is 500 ml, that volume enters the respiratory passages in the lungs. You see that the dead space is now occupied by purely atmospheric air. The new atmospheric air would have been saturated with water vapor anyway and that has moved into the alveolus. The oxygen in the alveolar air would have increased slightly, ever so slightly because new oxygen has come in and the carbon dioxide in alveolar air would have been diluted a little bit. However, the change in the composition is slight and for all practical purposes, we consider that the alveolar air composition remains almost the same as in the end expiratory state. So, in the end inspiratory state, dead space is occupied by something like atmospheric air which is just moisturized. There is no carbon dioxide. Whereas, in the end expiratory state, there is carbon dioxide as well in the dead space. Now, after inspiration, let us look at expiration. From this state, 500 ml of air would be expired if that is the tidal volume. The, if this is 500 ml, you notice that 150 ml of that is dead space air and the rest 350 ml is alveolar air. This will contain carbon dioxide whereas this fraction will not contain carbon dioxide. So, of the total 500 ml, only 350 ml is alveolar air. Our job now is to estimate the volume of carbon dioxide exhaled per breath and multiplying it by the respiratory rate, we will get the volume of carbon dioxide exhaled per minute. We can measure the volume of exhaled air, collect it in a bag and see how much air was collected or use a flow meter to see what is the flow rate of the air and integrating the area under the flow curve, you know what the volume of air exhaled is. That is the basis by which modern day spirometers work. They are composed of a flow meter. Therefore, you can estimate the amount of air exhaled. The way we estimate carbon dioxide concentration, we only take it at the end of the breath. Carbon dioxide will be continuously estimated as you breathe air out, carbon dioxide concentration. The end of the exhalation, if you look at carbon dioxide, it would be composed of purely alveolar air and you take that concentration as the concentration of PCO2 in alveolar air. You call it end expiratory carbon dioxide or alveolar carbon dioxide. So, if that measurement is 40 millimeter mercury, you know that the fraction of carbon dioxide in expired alveolar gas is its partial pressure over atmospheric pressure, which would be 5 percent. Let us say we get this equation volume of carbon dioxide exhaled per breath would be concentration of carbon dioxide in the alveolus or partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveolus. We will see how to estimate this divided by atmospheric pressure which would be the total pressure of any gas mixture. So, if the gas mixture is alveolar gas, you know 40 over 760 or 5 percent of that gas is carbon dioxide. And therefore, 5 percent of the volume of exhaled gas would also be carbon dioxide. Let us look at the numbers. The volume of alveolar air exhaled per breath is 350 ml and that is 5 percent of 350 ml. That is the amount of carbon dioxide coming out per breath. Multiply it by the number of breaths per minute, you would get 200 ml of carbon dioxide per minute. Now, you would wonder 
why should we know about this equation? Why do we go to great lengths calculating the volume of carbon dioxide exhaled? Indeed, this is the famous alveolar ventilation equation. It has a lot of clinical uses. Even if not clinical uses, it gives us certain intuitive understandings about respiratory physiology. It tells us that the volume of carbon dioxide exhaled per minute is alveolar carbon dioxide over atmospheric pressure into alveolar minute ventilation, which is ex exhaled alveolar gas volume into respiratory rate. Now, this is normally 4.2 liters per minute. That is the alveolar ventilation equation. You could replace this with alveolar minute ventilation. Why should we know about this equation? It's going to lead us on to another very important concept in respiratory physiology. This is the question I would like to leave you with. We will answer that in the next lecture. We just learnt that if we estimate alveolar carbon dioxide is 40 millimeter mercury, then the amount of carbon dioxide exhaled per minute would be 40 by 760 into alveolar minute ventilation, which is 4.2 liters per minute. This would be 350 ml into 12 breaths per minute. The question that I would leave you with is, if let us say there is hypoventilation, say respiratory muscle paralysis, somebody is not able to breathe effectively, alveolar ventilation reduces from 4.2 liters per minute to let us say 2.1 liter per minute. Let us say alveolar minute ventilation is halved, hypoventilation. In this case, what do we expect? Do we expect that the amount of carbon dioxide exhaled will be less? That is the question I'd like to leave you with. If there is hypoventilation, is the amount of exhaled carbon dioxide less? We will have an answer to this question in the next lecture. Thank you for watching.